Welcome to the podcast on Big Data with IEEE Computer. Your host is Katina Michael, Associate Professor at the University of Wollongong, Australia. Much has been written in the media about big data and public policy. The topic is so hotly contested and debated today because of the ever-changing technological landscape and ensuring social implications. The collision of the wireless internet with mobile social networking and cloud computing practices have challenged standard conventions with respect to data storage and ownership, copyright, and even one's right to privacy. Many commentators have emphasized that we are living in a generation with greater opportunities to be creative in design and innovative with data than ever before. If only we let go of our fears and anxieties over past practices and build a new hope on how things might be better in this data-driven future of promise. Joining us to discuss the topic of big data and public policy is graduate of the University of California, Berkeley, and data expert, Ms. Jess Hemley, who for identification purposes only, is a senior public policy and government relations analyst at Google Inc. It is important to state up front that her thoughts and reflections on this podcast are her own personal views. Jess, welcome to the program. Hi, Katina. Thank you so much, and thanks for the introduction. It's been great to have had the opportunity to interact with you over the last nine months, especially since the inception of the call went out uh, on this special on big data. Can I begin by asking you to describe the link between big data and data-driven innovation as you'd see it? Sure. So a lot of the buzz around big data, it, it tends to get caught up in uh, a bunch of different debates that don't necessarily focus on the actual, the actual outcomes or what it's sort of trying to achieve. And so when we think about data-driven innovation, we think about the outcome. We think about what people are actually doing with data and using the way that people are using algorithms to create new forms of analysis and models, the way that people sort of are building services and products based on data, and the way even that governments and policymakers are starting to take a look at, the own at their own data, at the data that they've generated you know, over just their basic, uh, basic functioning over the years, um, and coming up with better ways to make things more efficient, coming up with ways to uh, solve problems that they previously had um, been challenged to solve. And so I, I think that, that taking big data from this sort of this idea of it as a thing and putting a putting a more positive um, look, on, a more positive spin on it, for lack of a better way to put it, um, where you're talking about what it's actually doing, what people are actually doing with it. Um, I think it allows us to better hone in on the actual outcomes and the actual impact in a very interesting way. Okay, so uh, what are the things that we are doing with big data today? Um, so I can give a couple examples. One of my favorite examples. Um, is something called Flightcaster, which uses data analytics to actually predict flight delays before the airlines alert their customers. Then there are things that are really cool ways of mixing different types of data. Just in general, I mean, the city of New York has been really, I think, at the forefront in terms of, of civic data-driven innovation um, in taking, uh, taking different data sources from across the city uh, piecing them together and modeling things in ways to actually improve city processes. So, you know, improving things like fire response time or, or better understanding um, the ways that they sort of dole out licenses for different things um, has been, I, I think, really interesting. Um, and those are just some examples. I mean, even just uh, kind of, um, I, you know, the, the quantified self movement, I think, is, is a really interesting movement. And even if you're sort of not in, in it, um, and really dedicated to it where, you know, there are people who, who track their sleep, they track everything they eat, they track, you know, everything about their sort of body's function. Um, but even if you're just somebody who is a runner and you like to, you know, learn more about the way that you're training and sort of better understand the way that your body responds to exercise, you know, there, uh, there are numerous services that have been created um, to help you leverage that data, to help you better understand kind of what's happening and, and to your own body. And so, um, and that's, that's a great example because it combines sort of um, metrics that are recorded by you know a device that you you have with you when you when you run, and it overlays it on a map so you can sort of see your tr your progress. And then it, it you know there are so many different ways to feed in, um, and it also has a, a in many cases it has a, a social output so you can share it with other people and um, and compare your your activity to other people. Um, 
but I think it's really the, the combination of different sources of data has, be, has become really interesting, and I think that that is where we find um, the sort of most interesting, uh, the most interesting types of innovations. So we've talked about convenience, business process improvement, services planning, all these feedback loops uh, uh, going back to government, business, and the individual. How can one place a value on data? It's hard because you know I think that I think that with data, uh, a data set is not something that you can really appraise. Um, you can't you can't look at it and say, um, okay, this this data set is worth X amount of money, um, and that's because data sort of relies on on you know some sort of interpretation, um, and so some sort of algorithm to make sense of it, or, or some sort of um, a method of analysis to, that combines it with other data to sort of make it make that value. The value comes in the output. The value comes in the thing that's created from it. Um, and I and I think that you know if we do, if we talk about data as, as something or a data set as something that that has value, um, we get into arguments where uh, you know people are are people sort of try to uh, argue that data can and, and really only should be context specific. Um, but because one data set can be used in a, mul in, a in a variety of different places, like you can use a, you, you could use the the same set of of posts from Twitter, perform sentiment analysis on it, um, use it to understand uh, emergency response, or use it to understand uh, how people feel about your company, use it to understand um, kind of consumer sentiment around uh, you know a, a particular product or a particular brand um, and so so it's in that it's, it's for that reason that I, I I don't necessarily think of data data as something that you can you can measure the value of and so if we have produced X number of data sets from a government agency for example or, or a business enterprise can we use the data collected and gathered for one purpose to be analyzed for something completely different? And what are some of the for and against positions by various stakeholders? So I think that this, uh, this actually raises a, one of the sort of more interesting um, policy questions, which is um, you know, the OECD principles, and this is really around uh, personal data, and this is sort of where the personal data conversation uh, kind of begins in a lot of cases. Um, the OECD principles that were uh, sort of uh, put forth in 1980, so they are 23 years old, long before you know we even were used to communicating by email, um, and they are extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily, um, actually pretty, f for for much of their lifetime, have been fairly future-proofed um, in terms of how they can accommodate uh, the ways that technology have, has changed. But uh, what we see happening, uh, in particular, is you know because we don't know upfront how a data set may be used or or what kinds of things could really be done with it, uh, the, the purpose specification principle, for example, becomes a little bit difficult because if we're putting, you know, we, we can't, it's difficult to have a, somebody um, provide consent for a purpose that's yet to be known. Um, but at the same time, you know, if, you're, if, if, a, if a company or if a service is using personal data, then there, there, there should at some point be expected a communication at least between that um, user of data and the provider of the data, kind of what what may happen, what 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 the user can sort of expect, and so trying to to really navigate this landscape has been very tricky. Um, and you know, I think that that's a really, I think that that's one example where kind of where our old paradigms are being challenged by this sort of new landscape for data. Definitely, and these are just some of the public policy considerations. Uh, can you mention a few others that? Perhaps uh, you've written about in your paper. Yeah, sure. So you know, I think another thing, if we're sort of getting into this idea of you know purpose specification and 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 things like that, you know, I think one thing that um, one way, one thing that's interesting is is um, and possibly a, a good thing to remember um, is that privacy uh, controls and security controls are actually innovations too, um, and so finding ways. For, or sort of allowing to some extent the market, but also you know with with the guidance of, of consumers um, to figure out the way that they you know want to interact with their information and, and the best way to sort of engage and control that I think is is one interesting way to think about it um, and and being careful about the way that we sort of define uh, certain terms um, whether it's in the context of ownership um, or whether it's in the context of sort of privacy and security um, in my paper I also 
I talk a bit about um, uh, sort of what what IP ownership might or should look like for data sets. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's there's a lot of push um, to in order to get the most out of these data. You know, they they need to be out there. They, people need to have access to them. They need to be shared. But the challenge of that is that um, actually collecting and creating data, whether you're a scientist or whether you're a company or whether you're, you know, just one person, it, it takes it takes a lot of work. You know, what we need to do is sort of figuring out a way to to kind of reasonably distinguish between what what should and could be open and what could and should be private. Um, we can also think about licensing models, um, and in order to kind of create and maintain. Um, a database and allow, still allow it to be used, we see the potential maybe for, for some really strong licensing models. Um, and that's not, and I'm not just talking exclusively about governments, I know that actually some governments do um, use licensing models for their, um, for their, for their data. Um, but also just kind of in general, I mean another way of thinking about it is also, um, you know, in the United States, another public policy issue, the, the, the White House is very keen um, specifically about uh, open data and open data initiatives, and um, you know, not just mandating that data should be open, but finding ways to sort of encourage and create incentives for agencies to actually open that data in meaningful, machine-readable ways, so that it can be used and it can be reused. Um, and I think that um, in it, doing that creates a kind of has the potential to create a kind of civic engagement, um, so that people can sort of you know, understand their government better or interact with products and services uh, that their government provides in, in new and different ways. And I think a great example of that is, is public transit. Um, and I think also, you know, we sort of need to think about uh, data literacy. I think that, you know, as we, um, you know, science, technology, um, math education, very, very important. And I think we need to keep as part of that, you know, sort of data science. I think it's becoming, uh, Data professionals are ever more in, in growing demand. Um, people who can sort of look at people, not, and not only in terms of people who can create the algorithms and can sort of create the the models, but also the people who can who can check those models, who come from different perspectives and from different disciplines, and, and can look at something and say, look, this, you know, here here's where there may be a bias um, that's skewing this data in a, in a particular way, or that's skewing this out, output in a different way. Um, and understanding that kind of a multidisciplinary team is, is, is really, really necessary to make sure that, that, we, that we don't just sort of fall prey to our own models um, in a predictive set of the world. And I think we can see that uh, across academic institutions around the world where we have traditionally separate silo disciplines now being encouraged through grant schemes and other schemes to actually work together towards these large complex problems. I wanted to ask you more about what a typical data scientist looks like, what kinds of skills they come endowed with. I think basic coding skills, basic computer programming skills is invaluable. I mean, I don't, I don't code in my day to day, but the ability to do that and, and having that sort of under my belt to me is, is really valuable because it also allows me to, um, to look at things and understand problems in, in sort of that, in that way. Um, I think that we're looking for people who are really well versed in data analytics. Um, we're looking for people who can, you know, who understand metadata. I mean, the more, just as much as, uh, as data is being created, we're, we're seeing metadata to describe the data, um, which is a, a, a whole other set of data in and of itself. Um, we need people who can take the data and visualize it. So artists are, are vital, you know, in this, in this world, finding ways to present it in meaningful ways um, and interpret it for, for people. Um, even journalists, um, data journalism is, is really, really becoming an, an interesting uh, growth area of journalism in particular. Um, and then people who can kind of just, perf you know, on the, on the sort of te technological side, you know, machine learning and, and natural language processing are, are really those, having those skills and having the know-how to sort of perform those kinds of tasks is, is, is really, really going to become even more valuable than, than it is today. On closing, can big data give us concrete answers or it just gives us insights? What's your opinion on that? I believe data will help to give us insights, but in the end we still need to ask the questions. Um, we still need to be the, the people on the other end who sort of come up with the concrete answers based on what the output is. I don't think that necessarily these things are catch-all like I sort of said earlier. You know, we have to be able to 
to revisit our models, to review our assumptions, and to make sure that you know we're always thinking critically about the things that the sort of data are telling us. I think that we can come up with sort of the more concrete answers, but I, I don't think that the I think that the, that data and data-driven innovation can just help us do the work. Well, Jess, it's been a pleasure to have you on IEEE Computer. We wish you well in your role at Google and balancing all of the different challenges and opportunities around big data. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much. It was great talking.